Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the co-owners and managing directors with Impetus Digital. For those of you who do not know what Impetus Digital is, is we're a company that has built some of the best in class um, asynchronous and synchronous collaboration tools for pharmaceutical, med medical device, and healthcare companies. We actually help companies with everything from advisory boards to co-author working groups to investigator meetings. And unfortunately, since COVID-19, a lot of people have had to virtualize internal meetings like brand planning, POA rollouts and Salesforce trainings and all sorts of other things. At Impetus Digital, we really believe that everything starts with a thought and that thought turns into a conversation. And sometimes those conversations can be really courageous and really provocative. And that really in an essence is what this fireside chat or these conversations are. We want to become at Impetus the bridge, if you will, for having some of these big, hairy, audacious plans, ideas, innovations, creations. And we wanna be able to speak to provoca provocateurs and innovators and creationists who are doing something that's really, truly positively disruptive in healthcare. And at the end of the day, it starts with these conversations. So I'm really thrilled and honored to have somebody that I've been really interested in wanting to speak to in a while. Um, his name is Leo Grady and he is here. He is the CEO of a, a really innovative company. We're gonna dig into that today on a company called Page. And they use cutting, aid, cutting edge artificial intelligence to help pathologists, pathologists improve the efficacy and efficiency of their work. So um, they also help researchers generate new insights and help clinicians improve patient care. Um, Leo has a really interesting background. We're gonna dig in there a little bit, but he um, is a technology leader who brings the latest artificial intelligence, computer vision, and medical imaging technology to the healthcare market. And he does this through a lot of innovative products. And we're gonna talk about what Paige does today. He actually has a PhD in cognitive and neural systems from the Boston University. And before joining Page, he was the senior vice president of engineering at HeartFlow Incorporated. Um, and before that, he actually worked as a principal research scientist at Siemens. So he's got a lot of technology background and obviously in the, in the medical space as well. So it's obviously put him in a really great position to be where he is today, which is the CEO of Page. So welcome, Leo, so happy to have you here today. Thank you, Natalie, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. It's awesome. Um, wanted to see if we can dig a little bit, maybe to start off with your background. You were a researcher, you worked at Siemens, you were working on, you know, you have a PhD in cognitive and neural systems. Well, how did all of that culminate into you working and i'm assuming that you were one of the co-founders of page as well um what brought what brings you to the table and how did you get to page in the first place so i'm not a co-founder of page i was actually brought in after the company was founded because the founders were really looking for somebody who had both an understanding of the technology and of the way to bring new products to market in a healthcare space where there wasn't already a playbook and so that, that's how we got connected. The founder of Page, uh, Thomas Fuchs and myself, gave back-to-back -back talks at a conference about two years ago. And then uh, we went out to dinner and, and that led one thing to another until I ended up joining. That's fantastic. So where do you use your cognitive and neural systems, you know, PhD work? Is it something that you integrated it? Um, and what talk did you give that was so interesting to Fuchs? Well, it's funny because uh, back when I finished my PhD, it was almost 20 years ago, and the term AI was not what it is today. So BU had one of the first programs in this space, and they called it Cognitive and Neural Systems. But the technology that we were studying was really exactly the same as what we think of as modern AI. It was... 20 years earlier, but it was it was exactly an AI based PhD. And then I went from there to Siemens where I was applying the same kind of technology into various problems in healthcare, both at 
in radiology, but also in in vitro diagnostics as Siemens entered that space. Ultimately, as I learn more about the challenges of, of bringing this technology into clinical practice, I left and went to the Bay Area, I joined HeartFlow, and HeartFlow was a pure software company that was building the first computational diagnostic for coronary disease to be able to assess coronary disease non-invasively through software. And we went through clinical trials, we went through uh, FDA clearance, we had a NICE recommendation, uh, Medicare reimbursement, re reimbursement really from all of the major private players, and a change in the society guidelines for what the, the routine standard of care for coronary disease would be. And so it was an incredible journey. We pioneered many different areas of technology and cardiology and advancing software in this space. And so the background that I brought to PAGE was being able to do those clinical trials, being able to uh, work with the FDA to get a new kind of product, uh, both cleared and actually incorporated and brought into routine clinical practice. So, so let's actually I, dig in. So let's dig in a little bit and, and maybe you can describe to those who are watching what Page is and what your company's product does. So Page focuses on pathology and pathology is the branch of medicine where you take a piece of tissue out of a patient, uh, a tumor, a biopsy, and you look at it under a microscope. And the idea is to make an assessment of what the underlying disease is, either uh, cancer, not cancer, what stage, what grade, or is it something else, another type of disease or, or another type of, of uh, pathology at the tissue level. And Paige comes from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, one of the world's leading cancer hospitals, where we have worked with them and, and inherited the technology that was really created there that was a new kind of an, a new breakthrough in artificial intelligence that also leveraged all of this, um, these slides that Memorial Sloan Kettering had been scanning digitally uh, to really produce a technology that could find patterns in the pictures of these slides of these tissue and be able to match those against known patterns of cancer or other types of diseases that would really provide that information to the pathologist, to the doctor, so that they have that information for both uh, moving through their workflow faster, but, but, more off, but more importantly, really having the additional information to make sure that they get the diagnosis right for that patient. So the artificial intelligence that you're using, I mean, there's a lot of different tools that are available. Obviously, you spearheaded things before a lot of things that are just more automatic and integratable and you don't need to do programming. I mean, AI is almost becoming like a utility or like a grid, like the electrical grid where everybody's just kind of poking holes and pulling what they need. But you were obviously pioneers in this space. Did you actually, or did your company actually develop um, proprietary algorithms? I mean, is there, is there IP associated? What is it that your company specifically built on its own? So the foundational AI technology that really spawned Page was developed by Thomas Fuchs and his team at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And it was, it was an advance in artificial intelligence where it did not require an expert to look at the slide and say, these cells, those are cancer, and those cells, those are not cancer. The technology was able to look at just the diagnostic report where the pathologist had said, there's cancer somewhere or there's no cancer anywhere. And by seeing enough examples of those slides and those reports to be able to understand itself what patterns were indicative of cancer and which patterns were not. And so it was this breakthrough in technology that was published in Nature Medicine last year. 
And yes, it, it's patented. It was patented at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, and then that technology became the foundation for PAGE as it was spun out of Memorial Sloan Kettering. So does it utilize things like image recognition? And was that integrated into the algorithm as well? So the, the images uh, are known to be prostate cancer or breast cancer or lung cancer. And the questions are clinical questions. Uh, or sorry, they're, they're prostate tissue, breast tissue, lung tissue. And the, the questions are clinical questions. Are, is there cancer here? What grade is it? What stage is it at? How extensive is it? How large is it? And the technology is really intended to help the doctors not only get to those answers uh, easier, faster, but also in a way that's more standardized and quantitative. So before Paige came in the picture, pathologists were answering these questions themselves. So paint us the picture of like a day in the life of a pathologist world when they were looking at slides on their own, asking these important questions and how they were filling out the report. So what was the, what is or was the traditional model of a day in the life of a pathologist? Well, so imagine you're a pathologist and you're handed a book of glass slides and it's your job to figure out, does this patient have cancer or not? Uh, you might pull out a slide, look at it under your microscope, and you might see something that looks a little funny, a little suspicious. And you're not sure, is that cancer? Is that not cancer? Is this uh, an odd form of it? Or is it early stage? So maybe you ask a colleague, colleague comes over, you may talk about it, confer about it, Maybe you're still not sure. You go out and you get an additional test. Maybe you send that set of slides out to another hospital and that other hospital comes back and says, uh, you know, our experts looked at this and, and they believe that it is cancer. So that, that's the world of pathology uh, so far. And imagine a different world in which the pathologist is, is not looking at at the slide through a microscope, they're looking at it on a screen, on a monitor. Uh, the slide has been scanned and assessed by a computer. And that computer has matched all of the patterns in that tissue to known patterns for which, yes, there was cancer, no, there was not cancer. And that information is now available to the pathologist. So instead of having to ask a colleague, to be uncertain, to go get additional testing, to send those cases out, they can actually look at whether the patterns that the computer was able to match against a database is matching patients that have cancer or not, and can use that additional information to confidently make the right diagnosis for that patient. That's fantastic, and it's really fascinating um, when we think about it. And, and part of the whole machine learning you know, integration of artificial intelligence is this idea of the algorithm getting smarter over time. Is that integrated as part of that patented algorithm where the more data or the more use by pathologists across the country or across the globe, the more entries, the more utilization, is that making your algorithm smarter? Is it integrated into like a neural network of some sort? We do use neural networks. I think the key thing to understand is that this technology is very similar to other kinds of medical technologies. If you have a diagnostic test, uh, a blood test, uh, a test for a disease, that test may get better over time as you find out that uh, you need a, a clean blood sample, you need, it does, maybe it doesn't work in this population or that population, but the test doesn't just constantly change. Uh, when there's a new version of the test that incorporates this real world evidence and that new version of the test then needs to get updated, tested, validated, gone through the, the regulatory bodies effectively before it can be made available to the patients. So you would never take a diagnostic test and just continually fiddle with it over time and, and 
try that on real patients in a clinical setting. If you're going to improve it in response to new data, you have to do so with a new validation protocol, a new testing protocol, and really roll out a new version. And it's the same thing for us. Um, our, our systems are going to get better over time, but they're going to do so in a controlled way as we, we learn maybe there's a certain subpopulation that doesn't work as well in, or perhaps you need to clean the slides a little bit better in this kind of situation. And as we find that out and we make a new version of it, that new version is going to be made available, but it's not going to just be changing on its own. But yeah, that's and it's actually a really, really problem. interesting point because if we talk about FDA and we talk about the inclusion of these, you know, software as a as a medical device and all these things, it 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 there is that technical ethical question of at what point does a machine get smart enough, different enough, where it becomes a different entity, a different product, and that it needs to go through another FDA approval. So I think that's a really interesting phenomenon. So I just yeah, and we take a very conservative view of that that the that once the system is built it's locked down and that is what is provided to all patients uh, until such time as there's a new version that's better than the old one for which we can demonstrate that validate that and then make that one available not yeah, very interesting and very similar to the way drugs are developed and approved through FDA with additions or a change of administration route or you know more data or what have you so it sounds like a, a very similar process Absolutely. so i just kind of want to linger a little bit more on um you know this this whole idea of using artificial intelligence using you know something that's not human as part of this patient journey I'm just curious about some of the challenges and barriers, and you know, maybe I'm gonna go slice at a time here, <laughs> no pun intended as a pathologist, but maybe some of the potential laxity or slowness, if you will, of uptake some from stakeholders. What do you think is potentially holding some people back because, because of using AI? To be honest, I think that there's a, one of the, the biggest uh, challenges I see is people confusing a technology and a product. And AI is a technology, but it's not a product. At the end of the day, AI is a technology that can be used to build a product. And that product needs to go through trial. It needs to go through uh, all of the paces of any kind of medical device or any kind of of other sort of medical product, but it's, it's not a product on its own. So when people think of AI, they have this idea of a, a robot doctor that's gonna come and diagnose you. Or to, and uh, you know, the reality is that, yes, that's, a, that's one vision that some people have. I don't think that's, that's certainly not the reality of what anybody's building or what the technology can do. The fact is, AI is all around us uh, in a consumer space. It's, it's already around us in a healthcare setting too. Your electronic medical record can remind you to you know, order more inventory. Uh, well, that's done with AI. Uh, the doctor uh, might look at, at Google, uh, that's AI. Uh, they, they, there are MRI machines and CT machines that just the nature of the, the way in which they take a picture now and create a, a CAT scan or an MRI scan is made better using AI. None of it is a robot doctor though. And so I think when you think about AI, nobody thinks about Google, nobody thinks about the EMR, nobody thinks about uh, the creation of, of advanced images in a CAT scan. And so I think just in the same way with pathology, the less, the more we can focus on the actual, uh, what the product is doing and what the clinical benefit is and the, and the clinical data and evidence to support what the technology is doing. I think that's gonna both communicate it better and get people to realize that this is a new advance in medical technology that's gonna help them practice better and it's not something 
that you know doesn't bear much resemblance to uh, a clinical product. So Leo, just help me to understand. So this software that you've developed with Page, is it interoperable with a hospital or an institution's electronic health records? How is it integrated into the system? So when you have a, a set of slides uh, for a patient that have been prepared in pathology, those slides need to get scanned. And though they can get scanned through a variety of different vendors that have digital slide scanning, high throughput digital slide scanning devices. Once those slides are digitized, then those slides go into a storage system. And those, that storage system is something that, that Page is also uh, offering. And it, from there, or we can, we can interact with others, uh, and from there, we can then apply the, the software and the technology to do a preliminary assessment of those slides to extract those patterns. And then when a pathologist sits down to look at their cases, they can have that information available to them. Once they ultimately report out their case and, and render a diagnosis, typically that happens in a lab information system. And then that lab information system transmit that transmits that report into the electronic medical record. Right, excellent. I know that you were saying <clears throat> you work for another company that had more of a hardware software interplay. And now with Page, it's an all out software play. Do you see there being advantages or of one or the other and in, in, um, in how do you sort of explain that? Yeah, it's, it's very different. Uh, so with, with hardware, the advantage that you have is that it's your system that's actually the sensor that's actually generating the data in the first place. So you always have control over that. You know exactly how the physics is interacting with the sensor and you can understand the signals that are coming out of it. When you are just on the software side, you're now downstream from that. And so you can partner with this, the hardware vendors as we've done at Page with Philips, as we did at HeartFlow with Siemens and Philips and GE. Um, but you, you're not in control of it in the same way that you are with hardware. I think the, the challenge with a hardware company in this space is that ultimately you're differentiating on the hardware. The hardware tends to be the big ticket item from a, a costing perspective. And so any advanced software that you build, you're not likely to want to make it interoperable with others' hardware. And so ultimately the focus becomes the hardware and not the software. And that was one of my frustrations working at Siemens is we had all this amazing technology, all this amazing software. And yet at the end of the day, it's, it's almost an advertising play for the hardware so that it was not going to be something that could uh, have an impact broadly across the field because it's only when they own your hardware that they're gonna be able to get that software. And as somebody who's building that amazing software technology, uh, leveraging AI and, and a host, host of other related technologies, I wanted to be in a space where we could interoperate with any hardware and have that much broader uh, impact on the healthcare space. So it's really interesting, Leo, because what I'm hearing you say is by playing in the software space more holistically, you're much more interoperable and more immune, and so more hardware agnostic, if you will, and more immune to some of the demonetization and commoditization that can happen with a, a, hardware, a hardware play. This is very interesting because it's unlike what we're seeing with, for example, Apple, where it seems to be a little bit more of a hardware play where that's where they're trying to monetize and they're you know, moving away from Intel and you know, creating their own chips. And so it's, it's really interesting to see what angle people take either on the hardware or the software side. Well, I think Apple is a really unique company in, in that way because they are a hardware company, but they've always been a personal computing company. And so 
they, they've always looked at both the hardware and software elements to create that personalized experience. iTunes, uh, the, the Apple App Store, I mean, those are, those are big high value items for Apple as well. And it's really the holistic experience for Apple. Whereas if you look more at Samsung and Google, there's much more of a classic hardware software split there. And so I think Apple is more the exception than the rule. Uh, and particularly in healthcare, there are companies that do great hardware and software, but they're always better in one than the other. And when I was at Siemens, Siemens is an amazing engineering company. Ultimately, they're a hardware company. And although they, they create amazing software and they've got incredibly talented people there, the focus has always been on the hardware side. Yeah, it is very, it is very interesting to see what, what side of that equation. So as Page continues to evolve, where are you right now in terms of um, uh, come on, you know, uh, actual revenue generation, real, real B2B consumers, customers? Are you actually making money right now or is this still going through um, an FDA clearance process. Sort of tell us a little bit about where you are with that. Well, we were very excited uh, and humbled to receive the FDA breakthrough designation for our Page Prostate product. And that was uh, last year we received that designation. And what that means is the FDA determined that this is a technology that can significantly benefit patients and for which there's nothing like it on the market today. And when the FDA makes that determination, to date the only determination, uh, breakthrough designation for any AI technology in, in all of pathology or oncology that we're aware of, when the FDA makes that determination, it means that they commit to working with you closely to, to work on the protocol, work on the study, and to iterate with you in, in close communication, ultimately to move that technology to clearance. And so we've been very fortunate to be able to work with the FDA in that capacity and to, to work with them closely on defining those trials and the evidence it's necessary in order to, to get the product cleared. So far, uh, we have, we're not ready to announce clearance on that product. So we are, are continuing to work with them on that. And, um, and moving forward with it. Uh, that same page prostate technology did receive a CE mark in Europe, which means that it can be used clinically in Europe. And uh, the digital slide viewer that was first created at Memorial Sloan Kettering and then inherited by page also received a CE mark in, to be able to be used in Europe for primary diagnosis. So we're able to make those products available clinically in Europe, not yet in the US uh, as we work with the FDA. So let's just say theoretically you get the final rubber stamp from the FDA. What is the natural next steps of how this is going to become an integral part of hospital pathology departments? What is that plan or route or plan of action? Well, the, the technology ultimately depends on digitization. And so, and it also depends on having that clinical evidence that suggests that this technology is providing both clinical benefit and health economics benefit. And so we've been working with a number of early access sites who have early access to the product to be able to establish that body of evidence and we're starting to see some of those publications become uh, public now. Uh, there was a paper in Modern Pathology last month, and we're actively working with a number of other sites to uh, promote and publish additional work in this space. So that's really, you know, there's the, the FDA part of it, being able to uh, demonstrate safe and effective and getting that green light to be able to market and sell your product for clinical use. But even if you have that green light, 
if you haven't really provided the body of evidence that tells pathologists this is something that's going to help you, that's going to make your life easier, that's going to help you treat your patients more effectively, then there's going to be hesitation to go forward and adopt it. And so that's why we've been working with these early access sites to build that body of, of evidence, to be able to publish it and make that available. And ultimately that's what's going to be what moves the field forward in, in pathology. So I just kind of want to linger a little bit more on that whole FDA process. I'm assuming we're calling this real world evidence collection and you know the whole process around that. And with that as well too, is a whole question around how you're involving patients, like the patient centricity part of this. Are patients involved at all? Is, I mean, there's one thing about involving patients as it relates to end products or end use, but are patients being brought in on the diagnosis piece of the equation? Are they being involved in the development of these sorts of studies and evaluation of diagnostics? Typically, the first place to start when you're building evidence for a new technology is with retrospective studies. So that's, that's exactly what we've been engaging in with a number of partner sites where we're looking at patients that have already been treated. They've already uh, had the, the course of their disease managed uh, based on the decisions and the technology available at that time. And we're taking a second look at those cases and saying, if we'd had PAGE, what would we have done? How does that match up with what actually was done? What, how does that match up with the trajectory of these patients and the ultimate outcomes of those patients? So that's been the first place to start. Ultimately, as you get to a point where you want to make a prospective uh, statement about the, uh, the care of patients, that's when you have to enroll them into a trial and that, that's when you would be uh, you know, getting informed consent from those patients and working with them in order to be able to do that prospective trial. In that sense, it's really like every other medical device uh, out there. Right. Now, the other part to all of this is there's an important piece eventually, if it does get approved by the FDA as an important um, clinic, you know, clinical diagnostic, is who's going to pay for this? So as we start to think about Medicaid, Medicare, you know, patients paying it for themselves and looking at the value proposition, this is really interesting because it's a diagnostic. It's not a medication. And sometimes there isn't anything specific that results from it like hardcore metrics like reduced number of hospitalizations or you know, reduced waiting times. Those are things that have really concrete metrics. How, how is PAGE trying to frame out the value proposition for your product uh, around efficiency, you know, missed detections, those sorts of errors? How do you um, economize those or put those into actual value terms? Yeah, if you look at the, uh, that's a great question. If you look at the modern pathology paper that was just published, what, what was shown there on a small study is that what we looked at was pathologists that were looking at slides and doing their diagnosis and then they went home for five weeks they came back and they did their diagnosis a second time on the same slides but the second time they used page they had the information available from page that said this area of the case is suspicious for cancer and it called their attention to those areas and what we found in that paper is that, or in that study, which is published in the paper, was that when pathologists had that additional information, that they were much more likely to avoid missing cancers. So the number of false negatives went dr dramatically down when they were using PAGE and they had the additional information from PAGE. And particularly in smaller cancers that were still clinically significant. And so if you translate that into health economics terms, there have been a number of publications on how do you quantify the costs of every case that, or every diagnostic error. And there, there have been a number of studies around this 
the number that I see most common in these publications is about $21,000 per uh, error in pathology. And that's across all different types and subspecialties. But if you take that number and you say, okay, well, if the introduction of PAGE is able to substantially reduce the number of missed cancers, the number of errors, then that has a, a clear uh, patient benefit. It also has a clear economic benefit for the, the hospital and for the doctors. Have you been able, or is there any papers or written reports on the other side of that? which is the false, <laughs> I mean, obviously this is, might be an ethical question, mm -hmm. but false positives where somebody might've been treated for a cancer that they might not have had at a specific degree, um, what have you. And there was a whole assortment of costs associated with a treatment that might've been falsely administered, or is that an ethical um, place that, you know, Paige and others don't re really necessarily want to run down? Well, it's very important, as you said. I mean, a patient that gets treated incorrectly uh, is, um, I mean, that can lead to tragic consequences. I've read several accounts of patients that had um, treatment that for benign lesions. I read one account of a woman who had a double mastectomy and full chemotherapy uh, because there was a, a false reading of cancer on, on her pathology report. These are very serious situations. And I do think that Paige has an opportunity to help with those as well. When we look at the, the data from that study that was published in, in Modern Pathology, what we found is that there was there was no significant difference statistically in the rate of false positives, that the really big difference there was in the rate of false negatives. So missing cancer that was actually there. So at least in that study, that was really demonstrating the benefit of the technology for that case. I think subsequent studies uh, are going to have to look at, at the case that you bring up of of false positives and, and unnecessary treatments. So these are two really interesting questions for hospitals, economies, patients, and everybody and all in, involved stakeholders. On the one hand, if PAGE is able to effectively diagnose patients who might've been falsely detected as being negative, is there a possibility that health systems may want to rebut against PAGE because of concerns of economic feasibility of suddenly entering a whole series of patients that they may not have had to entertain earlier? Is this, is this a, a, an economic question or an ethical question that might have come up, you know, either directly or indirectly to PAGE? Ultimately, uh, PAGE doctors, healthcare providers are trying to provide the best care for patients. And that is the primary driving force of the healthcare system. And there, there have been known examples in the past in which economic incentives were such that uh, patients didn't always get the best care because of the, the economics associated with that. In this case, the economics are well aligned because if you miss cancer on a patient and they come back with stage four, now they're on chemotherapy and now they're getting surgery and now they're on life support or palliative care, that is much uh, more costly to deal with from a healthcare system, from a payer standpoint than catching it early. Obviously, it's, it, most importantly, it's better for the patient to catch it early. But from a health economic standpoint, it's also much better to catch it early. That's actually a really, really important point. And I think that's, that's an important caveat to make for sure. Now on this note, again, on the, the, the side of the, the, the equation of being able to detect earlier and more is there's obviously a lot of people with a vested interest in that, mainly pharmaceutical companies and companies who have really good viable 
prostate cancer products amidst others. And I'm sure there's other things that you're looking at further down the pipeline. Um, are you partnering with pharmaceutical companies? Are these discussions that you're having for ongoing real world evidence, clinical studies for further discovery? What are you doing around partnerships? Yeah, absolutely. We, we have a partnership with a number of, of big biopharma companies. And that, that's to look at the application of our existing technology, but also to go beyond what is known uh, visibly within the, the tissue. And what I mean by that is that there, there's substantial evidence at this point that there are characteristics of certain tumors of cer certain microenvironments with surrounding tumors that indicate certain mutations, indicate uh, certain protein expressions, indicate uh, the capability of certain drugs to be more effective or less effective. And because of our relationship with Memorial Sloan Kettering and because of our, our unique technology, we're able to look at those questions in a way that has not been possible before. And so we are actively working with a number of biopharmas to really identify computational assays, computational biomarkers that can help determine whether or not a patient's gonna to respond to a certain therapy. And I'll give you one example, so that, which we just, um, which was just made public at ASCO, where we're working with uh, Janssen. And what we showed there is that th they had a problem, which is that they were looking at the application of a therapy in a neoadjuvant setting for patients with prostate cancer, meaning they were going to give the drug to the patient before surgery. And then they wanted to know, is that enough or do they need to do more. And when you, when you then remove the patient's prostate out and you look at it, the question that they wanted to know, the answer to is, is there any cancer left or did we get it all with the therapy that we administered? The problem of trying to answer that question is that the act of administering the therapy had an effect on the tissue such that it was damaged, that it was warped, that it was very difficult to distinguish even what normal tissue looked like much less to accurately determine whether there was any cancer left. So their approach had been to look at whether or not there were, it was possible to have uh, an elite set of pathologists who were trained, who could then go through and make that assessment of, is there cancer left even in these, these treatment damaged prostates? And when working together with them, we were able to show that the PAGE prostate system was able to identify residual cancer in these prostates, even though uh, they had been damaged by the tissue. And what that opens up is, is the way, uh, an opportunity to standardize how residual cancer gets measured, pathological complete response gets measured, to uh, make it available uh, for trials, for studies to really look at this, but then ultimately, as it's proven to be a, a, a companion diagnostic or a complementary diagnostic, then to be able to roll it out and make it available clinically for the clinical assessment of pathological complete response in order to um, determine whether or not a patient can stop therapy or they need to go on. So you were talking about <clears throat> partnerships with big biopharmaceutical companies, but one of the other com ideas that comes to mind is that we're now in a space of completely uber personalized medicine, almost to the point where futuristically you can almost look at the end of one, you know, medical intervention, you know, on a patient by patient level. And that's a bit sci-fi right now, but ultimately the bridge towards that is really going to be on these optimal diagnostics and coming up with really personal, personalized ways of approaching disease. So where do you see PAGE fitting in, not only in partnering with biopharmaceutical, but with diagnostic companies? And really my next question is, is does PAGE become a diagnostic company? Do you create new biomarkers? And are you the new creators and innovators of these things that we were going to diagnostic companies for? I think that is uh, a very astute 
uh, observation about the direction of, of this technology. I think, um, let, me, let me answer that question by giving you an example from HeartFlow. So at HeartFlow, we were assessing coronary disease, but we weren't doing it from kind of population-based studies. What we were doing is we were building a 3D computational model of your heart, of that patient's heart, of that patient's coronary uh, arteries, of that patient's uh, blood flow through those coronary arteries. And by doing so, we could assess not only do you have a, a stenosis that requires treatment or not, but we could really pinpoint the severity of the treatment uh, or the severity of the disease, the, the locations of the disease. And then we took it a step further, which was the ability to put a virtual stent into the coronary and say, if I put a stent in this patient at this location of this length, how does that restore blood flow? And ultimately what that means, and that, that was an, that's an FDA cleared product that's available today. Um, and what that means is that for that patient on a completely personalized setting, you can say for your heart, for your disease, this treatment is going to treat you effectively. And if we consider that same concept, that same paradigm in an oncology setting, the cancer setting, if we can really understand a tumor, if we can understand the tissue and the microenvironment, and we can understand how that relates to the rest of the patient and the disease, we should be able to calculate what's going to be the effect of this treatment, what's going to be the effect of this therapy, and assess whether it's going to be more effective or less effective for this patient. And that capability, that computational capability, is personalization not only at the patient level, but at the tumor level, at the tissue level, at the, the, the specimen level, to say this drug is going to effectively treat this patient right now. And so with those computational capabilities, as we build those out, I think it's going to go in exactly the direction that you're saying, that PAGE is going to be able to provide that kind of technology first to the therapeutic companies that say, okay, this therapy is going to work, this therapy is not, maybe you should actually consider something like this that might work better in this, this situation. And then as we engage with them and build out those capabilities and prove it through classical clinical trials, to make that capability available to doctors, to hospitals, to patients that want to know exactly how do I treat my disease. So I'm just going to take the other side to this. We were talking about a lot of the pros and one of the things that kind of comes to mind as we talk about the two sides to the coin is the other side where we're looking at the, po the possible um, false uh, positives, actually, you might say the pot, um, the ones where there was actually, you know, no disease or there was disease and whatever ramifications happened as a, as a result of an incomplete or incorrect diagnosis. And now that you were saying that there's a lot of retrospective studies that can happen and then you can verify what happened or what didn't, is there a possibility that there could be some pushback from the pathology community with concerns of potential lawsuits um, or other negative repercussions that could happen as a result of looking backwards retrospectively on decisions that were made and is there concerns about that? Well, I think you're right that, that it's something that we all need to be sensitive to, right? Because for example, if you were to do a retrospective study and you find out that a patient was not adequately treated and that they ultimately had a, an adverse outcome, then that could, that knowledge after the fact could create um, challenges for that hospital. Uh, any study that we're doing retrospectively is not unique in this sense, right? Any Anytime you would go back and do a retrospective study with any sort of new medical device, you can ask those same questions, even if it's a new um, pathway for the patient. I mean, as, as societies look at new guidelines and uh, look at whether or not certain patients could have been treated better 
if they'd gone through this pathway or that pathway, you know, they run into the same issue. And so there are mechanisms in place that allow you to engage with a hospital and in the interest of patient safety, in the interest of improving healthcare, to be able to engage in those kinds of studies in a way that limits the liability for a hospital to look at it and to, to get that information. Because the last thing that we want is as a society is that hospitals just put their head down and they say, well, I'd rather not know. No, of course we want them to know. As a patient, you want them to know if there's a better way of doing something so that next time they'll, they'll be able to do it in that way. Eric Topol has written a lot of really amazing forward thinking books on technology and what it means. I mean, he's probably one of the number one sort of physicians who's in this space. And one of the concerns obviously is about roboticizing um, or automating people, things, specifically clinicians. Is there a potentially some backlash to the automated pathologist in the world that you're creating that maybe one day if Paige is good enough and shows almost stellar abilities and efficiency above and beyond what is being shown through the human, um, is there any concerns that are kind of bubbling up from the pathology community about ousting the pathologist out of their jobs? I think this goes back to the earlier part of our discussion where we were talking about AI. What is AI? And I think if somebody, uh, you know, by using that term or overusing that term or thinking about that term as the, the goal, that suggests that you're trying to build a robot doctor, an automated doctor. And that is, in my view, um, a very extreme uh, way of thinking about the, the trajectory of this technology. Uh, just like Google, just like the EMR, just like all of these things that are already using AI is providing new information to doctors, helping them uh, do their job. I think that there's a lot of opportunity to leverage this technology in a way that gives them new information, that gives them new diagnostic information to help them make better decisions for their patients. And so I certainly think that if you engage too much in a conversation about AI, that that tends to be the direction that the conversation goes. And it's why I really think that, uh, I think it's a distraction to be honest, because the technology that we have today and that we continue to build can do many things that couldn't be done before that really provides substantial clinical value that can, has proven clinical value. And in that way, it's no different than any other medical device, any other diagnostic. And I think by by considering it in that framework and proving it and doing the clinical studies, that, that's what's really gonna demonstrate to the pathologists that this technology, this new product, this new device is going to help them better treat their patients. Beautiful. And that, that's been our focus at PAGE. And I love the work that you're doing, obviously a very important space in the oncology world, um, you know, very, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot going on there. So it sounds like you're starting in prostate and then going into breast and lung. Just out of curiosity in terms of future thinking and the fact that you have a cognitive um, neuroscience background and thinking about the world that we're in post COVID pandemic, you know, during po pandemic, however you want to word it, that where we are today in the pandemic and thinking about the ramifications of the mental health space, the wellness, the, uh, the, the areas around neural, neural pl places and cognitive whatever. Is there going to be some futuristic way or mechanism that companies like a page are going to be able to make you know, mental health biological where there's actually going to be systems for measurement and metrics to evaluate certain mental conditions and PTSD and anxiety. 
um, before it happens, before it hits really hard, what is the future of page? Um, and I'm just saying that might be one area that might not even be the area. So what is the future for page? Well, in the context of mental health, uh, I don't know that that is the direction that page is going to be operating in. Uh, there's been a lot of work in the scientific literature of computational assessment of certain mental conditions, trying to understand at a biological sense, what, what is Alzheimer's, what is Parkinson's, what is anxiety, what is de depression, how do we treat it, what are the mechanisms, how do you detect it, how do you quantify it? And that work continues, and I think uh, there have been some successes, I think there's a long way to go there. Uh, from the standpoint of PAGE, we're very focused on cancer and, and being able to leverage the technology that we have to enable pathologists to be uh, more effective, more efficient, to get more information in the treatment and, and diagnosis of their patients. And, uh, and then at the same time, build a new, additional biomarkers and diagnostics with the biopharma industry that can help assess what the right treatment is, whether a certain drug or a certain therapy is going to be more effective or less effective on this patient specifically, and then ultimately make that available to hospitals and physicians and patients as well. So that, that's our focus at PAGE. I love it. And very, very exciting about the kind of work that you're doing, integrating AI in a very practical, non-abstract way. Something that's actually tangible, usable, interoperable with electronic health records and going through the, the required FDA process. I think this makes this very real. So very exciting work. Thank you very, very much, Leo. Um, I could be asking you questions for hours. This is an awesome, exciting topic. Um, and again, just as a reminder, these are the kinds of conversations that we want to have. These courageous conversations, these positively disruptive conversations in healthcare with all the different stakeholders, pharmaceutical, bio, bio um, medical devices, um, other stakeholders. Um, we are the bridge of this at Impetus Digital with our asynchronous and our synchronous virtual collaboration platform. Getting beyond the pill, getting beyond the average and doing something a little different. So please be on the lookout. We will be sending an email with a link to this webinar if you wanna share this with your friends. We'll be posting this on our YouTube and podcast channel as well as Twitter and other social media. And um, feel free to, uh, to take a look at this. Thank you very much, Leo, and uh, really appreciate your time today. And uh, wishing you and Paige much success in the future. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's been a real pleasure to join you today. Thank you. Thank you everybody for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.